to use him. And I thank you for our time here tonight, for I know that you have something special. And we just prepare our hearts yes. for your word, for heaven to be open for the revelation and inspiration to be revealed purpose and plan to be revealed in understanding to be received that we your people can walk in the truth that you revealed to us tonight I pray a special blessing on Kenny that his ears are in tune to you, yes, thank you Father. that you Father speak clearly and yes. distinctly to him and that he Father unreservingly release that which you give him to give to us we also know that he's not just called to specific ministries but as you have called your apostles prophets evangelists pastors and teachers to the perfecting of the saints that's all your people and so i pray that the word that goes forth from this place that it remain not in this place but it goes forth to the to the ends of the earth yes. father that your people will hear will receive and will obey bless him Thank and you, keep Father. him in Yeshua's name Amen Amen. well ladies and gentlemen receive the ministry of Dr. Kenny Russell hallelujah amen, amen. Hallelujah. let's fire all this stuff up one day we'll have Siri we'll be able to get past your password you know <laughs> look Siri's not available I'm just trying to open the thing here <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, it is a blessing to be here at the house of Israel. You know, it's not just what happens here, it's what's happening around the world. And Arthur, um, as I travel in the nations, the testimonies I hear of the people who are blessed because of your ministry in different countries, different parts, even of this country, is just amazing because we need an environment that deals with discipleship. And just the last few weeks on Bulldozer Faith on our platform, um, we uh, replayed Sunday's Not the Sabbath with, with Arthur and uh, discipleship, a message on discipleship, the importance of discipleship. And the testimonies that come in continually from those broadcasts are amazing. We, we were getting calls coming in and people writing to us who are waking up to the Sabbath for the very first time. And it's exciting because, you know, one thing I see as I travel and, and people that are not traveling don't really get the understanding of what's going on. You might, you might be watching in your home right now and just thinking, well, I'm just isolated. I'm on my own. Let me tell you something. I've traveled to cities, different nations, gone through the streets, maybe even in the town you live in. And I have found that the seeds, uh, the fields are ripe on the harvest. People are ready for the truth. We just came off a trip to the UK and we had the privilege of ministering to over 35 pastors, Christian church pastors, and the reception for the truth is incredible. They are ready. It is time for us to take the gospel of the kingdom to this generation. It's time. And it's exciting to be here in America. I wasn't meant to be here. I'm meant to be back in Israel. I was meant to go back a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but I had to cancel my ticket just because the Father had work for me to do here. And that's what it's about. It's about being in, uh, on time and in place. And it's, it's a blessing to be in full-time service for the King and have that flexibility just to be able to go when He says go and to be available for Him. And that's where He wants all of us. He wants to bring us to the place if He calls. You know, what's the whole plan of the enemy? Get you so locked up that when the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, speaks to you and says, go, you go, well, you know, I have to bury my father. <laughs> and it's not that the father was ready <laughs> to die. It was the responsibilities that were held. And, you know, it's not about uh, living by faith and walking by the Spirit. It's not about giving up on responsibilities, but it's dealing with the transition of how do we change from the responsibilities of this world? How do we align ourselves back into the responsibilities of the kingdom? Because we are not of this world. We are bought with a price. We are bought with a price. And the more we study the Scriptures, the more we start to realize you know, just how amazing he is. We want to lift up his name as we were worshiping there, David. It was incredible. He knows 
the wrong choices. He knows the paths that we're going to take, yet he loves us. Yes, he does. Now, the angels, they can't fathom all this. They're, they're, they're just, they can't understand it. So if they can't understand it, how can we really understand it? As they're going, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. As they are before the throne, they don't understand it. But the Father's heart is so powerful. He loves you. He loves me. He wants us to walk in his presence, in his will. He has designed us for a purpose. I really believe that our hope levels are so low in this day, in this generation, that we are missing so much of what the Father has. Because what's the plan of Hasatan? His plan is to put you into deferred hope. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. He wants us in the place of deferred hope. You know, how many times were people called in the scriptures? Moses is called and he's like, oh, hallelujah. I was waiting for you to show up in the bush and give me my orders. And, you know, that's our desire, isn't it? We, we come, we fellowship, and, Father, speak to me, give me my orders. And there's Moses, he's like depressed. Just leave me alone for 40 years. I'll just look after a bunch of dumb sheep. And here comes the master speaking through a burning bush. I've called you. He should have said, whoa, hallelujah. I've been waiting for this day. And that's not what happened. Why? Because he had been in such deferred hope that he never even knew that his promise could come to pass. He never even knew that the reason he was born was going to walk out in his life or work out in his life. Where are you at today? What are you going through today? Do you have a promise that the Father has given you? Is the enemy trying to take that promise and put it into the place of deferred hope? Have you fallen short? Have you failed just like Moshe, just like Moses did? You know, when he killed um, the Egyptian soldiers and ran off. I've failed. I can't fulfill my promise. I'm out of place. Is that where you feel tonight? If that's where you feel, you're in the right place because it's the place of hard knocks. It's the place of difficulty that actually brings transformation to our lives. A verse of scripture I share literally all the time. It's just burnt within my brain. Consider it pure joy, my brothers. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith, what was it? <laughs> Did, <laughs> the testing, of, my brain's gone. I must be, I can't be jet lagged. I'm not going to use that excuse. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. God, goodness me, that is something else, isn't it? Don't worry, we'll wake up in a few minutes here, you know. Sometimes they say it takes me 45 minutes to get moving, you know. But consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so you can be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Hallelujah. Oh, so let's pray for the storms. Now, you know, I've been in meetings where I'm praying for the storms to come. People come up to me and say, you know, Kenny, I really appreciate the time of prayer we're having, but I don't like what you're saying. God, bring the storms. Well, I'm not going to change how I pray, but what I'm going to change or pray for is that we actually come to a place of maturity. And as Arthur shared at the beginning of this, uh, this session here, the importance of discipleship, the importance of understanding the truth, we must get to the place that we can handle any uh, professor, PhD of religion, Old Testament studies, Hebrew studies. We have got to get to the place where we understand this word. Amen. I've sat in many meetings with people who are way more educated than I am within the Christian world, and I've watched the Ruach HaKodesh melt their hearts as they come to the realization of what the truth is. It's time. The Word is alive. Hallelujah. His Word is true. He is amazing. He is going to finish His words that He has sent forth. 
So if you're in a place where you feel like your hope level's too low, I want to tell you, it's not about you. It's about him. But yes, we need to know what it is to submit to him. How do we do that? Well, we're going to read from the book of Hosea. But before we get there, let's just go to the book of Deuteronomy. We're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter chapter 30 in the book of Deuteronomy. I love reading the, the book of uh, or chapter 30 of this book. Why? Because it's the very foundation of the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel is not just say this prayer after me, accept Yeshua into your heart and you've got your ticket and you're free and, you know, just, you know, go and have your personal salvation. Go get your little personal space with Jesus. You know, that's not the gospel. It's the gospel of the kingdom. Yeshua sent the disciples out to raise the dead, heal the sick, cast out devils. And they hadn't even asked Jesus into their heart yet. <laughs> you know, when you think about it, like, goodness me, man, you want to come and uh, go pray for the sick? And well, let me ask you a question. Do you ask Jesus into your heart? <laughs> you know, you know, when he fed the 5,000, he didn't feed them with with uh, manna from heaven. He blessed the food. He broke it. It was miraculous provision. The kingdom was here. It was before us. The people were partaking of the kingdom. It was miraculous. And he didn't say, well, I'll just use this for my own personal agenda. Now I'm going to get you in a headlock and I'm going to manipulate you to ask me to come and live in your life. That's not what he did. He blessed, he gave, he poured out, and he turned around and he walked away. He healed the sick. He spoke forth the truth. We're coming to the place where I believe we're about to see one of the most incredible outpourings of the Spirit on this earth that we are in today. And what do we have? We have a whole bunch of people trying to get the race to the end. You know, it's like watching one of those movies where everyone's got this time they've got to do to complete this task by the end of the movie. And they're all running, traveling all over the country uh, and all that type of stuff. And it's like the end times. Everyone's fascinated. Just give me the end time prophecies. That's all I want to know. But here's the reality. The prophecies concerning the end times are about the restoration of all things. We start in a garden and we end in a garden. It's the restoration of all things. And everyone just wants to understand the end times because all they're trying to do is get out of here. Oh, brother, just got to get out of here. Can't take it anymore. Is that living in the blessing and the promise and the fullness of what Yahovah has for us? Oh, I just need to get out of here. Oh, I love you, Father, but get me out of here. You know? i never forget when I put my head in a three and a half thousand gallon uh, uh, milk tank when the father was calling me to work in this dairy, and I scream out in this empty tank. I said, God, either get me out of here or teach me. And then he said, I'm going to teach you. And that was not what I wanted to hear. But you know what? It changed my life. I learned a whole trade by the voice of the Spirit. He radically changed my life. And I want to ask you a question. Are you praying right now that you just want to get out of here? I want to ask you, will you allow the Ruach HaKodesh to teach you? Let him teach you so you can actually live the life. Let him teach you so you can walk the life. That's what it is all about. So I'm not going to read the first part of Deuteronomy chapter 30. We're going to go to verse 11. Now, what I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It's not up in heaven so that you have to ask who will ascend into heaven to get it or proclaim it to us so that we may obey. Nor is it beyond the sea, so that you have to ask who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to, to you or to us so that we may obey it. No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth. It is in your heart. Uh, so you may obey it. Hallelujah. The word is near you. As we come together tonight, I speak an open heaven right now over every one of our lives. That His Word is near. That we have eyes to see. That we have ears to hear. That we have a heart that understands. 
Why do we need to hear his words? Why do we need to understand? Why do our hearts need to be in the right place? Because obedience brings forth blessing. Oh, brother and sister, I just want to get out of here. If we could change from the get me out of here mentality to living and walking this life, we will see transformation within our communities. We'll see transformation within our families. Verse 15, see, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. Oh, why has he got to do that? You ever ask that question when you read the Bible? Just give me the good stuff. You know, that's what the daily devotion five minutes that you can buy in most of your Christian bookshops are all about. Just give me the good stuff. Here's the good stuff, brother. Just have five minutes of the good stuff every day and you are going to be A-OK. But that's not what it says in the scripture. I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love Yahovah your Elohim, to walk in his ways and to keep his commands, decrees and laws. Then you will live and in increase and Yahovah your Elohim will bless you in the land you are entering to, to possess. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient, and if to other gods, if you go and bow down to what other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. Oh, that's not very encouraging. It's very encouraging. Why? Because the Father gives us the guidelines. When we have guidelines, we have safety. When we have guidelines, we have order. Oh, brother, what do you mean keep the commands and follow Torah today? We're under grace. We're free. But the question is, how many laws do we have in the countries in which we live? Oh, 600. Oh, you're killing me. My commandments are not too difficult. They're not beyond your reach. I'm so glad when I come up to the traffic lights that people stop where they're meant to stop and go where they're meant to go. Hallelujah. And, you know, don't get legalistic on me now. Don't think I'm, le I'm a legalist now. It is freedom to know that you can breeze through that green light. You're not thinking about it. You're not thinking, I wonder what's going to happen when I go through the green light. Is it going to be bad? Is it going to be good? Some parts of town, you might have to watch. <laughs> if you're in South Africa, you're not going to stop <laughs> in some places. <laughs> anyway, verse 19, this day I call heaven and earth as a witness against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love Yahovah your Elohim. Listen to his voice and hold fast to him for Yahovah is your life, and he will give you many years in the land he has sworn to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Here's the promise. But if your hope is on a promise that's not in line with the Torah, then we're just, we're just skimming on the, on the top of the surface. And the Father is saying, I want you to lift your eyes up and I want you to place your hope in the very place that is found within Scripture. This is our guidepost. This is our life. Choose life. We all know that Moshe, Moses, he led the people. He did incredible things. He put the Torah down for us. He, he instructed the people. He saw the manifestation of his kingdom in action. A pillar of cloud by day, fire by night. As he said to Pharaoh, let my people go. And his people were drawn out. He saw the miraculous move of the spirit. But you get to the end of the book of Deuteronomy. And here you come to the realization that this man failed. He failed, and he wasn't allowed to enter the land. Oh, brother, I'm anointed, and I'm appointed. I can't fail. If Moshe, if Moses can fail, then we can all fail. But even in the midst of it, in his failure, you know, there he was at Mount Transfiguration with Yeshua, and there was Moshe in the land. Isn't that incredible? 
But he broke the shadow picture. He broke the shadow picture. Hit the rock to bring forth the water the first time. Then the second time, speak to the rock, representing the two comings of the Messiah. And through his anger, he struck the rock. And that very act cost him entering into the land. What's it going to take for us to enter into the fullness of his promise? Obedience. I believe that we have a responsibility today just like Moses. I believe that we are called to usher in the second coming of the Messiah. I believe we have prophecies within this book that speak very clearly about what is going to happen in this day and our part. There's a part that we have to play. And if we damage that shadow picture, we will not enter in. We have to understand what that picture is. We look at the very last few verses, or not quite, of 31. It's verse 15, or 16, sorry. It says, And Yehovah said to Moses, You are going to rest with your fathers, and these people will soon prostitute themselves to the foreign gods of the land they are entering. They will forsake me and break my covenant I make with them. On that day, I will become angry with them and forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they will be destroyed. Just pause and think about that for a second. Here is Yehovah. Here is the Creator. Here is the Messiah. He knows what's going to come, yet he loves. Love is powerful. Love is amazing, and his love is on a level that we cannot comprehend. I want to speak a prophetic message tonight to wake you up. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what sin has been in your life. I don't know what the enemy is saying to you about it being all over. You know, you might think you've done so much, you can never return, you can never walk in these promises. You might think you've gone beyond, beyond, beyond. But I believe this is a day of supernatural transformation. I believe it's time for us to wake up because many times the reasons why we have failed is because we haven't had the instruction manual. We haven't known what the truth is. We've been going through this walk, this lukewarm walk, and it's supposed to be a relationship with the Messiah. And then here we are seeing weakness and failure all around us. I want us to turn now to the book of Hosea. This is a book that I have been laboring over for quite some time. And sometimes when I read the book of Hosea, tears come to my eyes as I read the pages of this prophetic book. It's so incredible just to read. Because the picture of Yehovah we see is beyond anything you could ever imagine. It's so powerful. Talk about unfaithfulness. Talk about being in a place where it is all over. Talk about the heart of the Father calling the people to be aligned in His blessing, to be aligned in His Torah. Hosea has to live out this prophetic word through his life, through the names of his children. He has to marry a harlot. And we saw back in Deuteronomy, we saw that if you disobey me and you don't follow in my ways, that you're going to go off and prostitute yourselves to other gods. That's what we just read. And here we are in that day. Here's Hosea walking this walk. And he's calling the people to a place of repentance. The book of Hosea is a message of conviction. Oh, don't you know what it says in Romans? There's now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Yeshua, the Messiah. That's right, but let's read it in context. We should be condemned if we're walking a sinful life. It's only no condemnation if we're in the Messiah, if we're walking in His ways. If you're out of His will, out of His ways, you need to experience what it is to walk in a place of conviction because only in that place can we see supernatural transformation. 
This is a message of hope. This is a message of deliverance. You might have just tuned in right now and you're thinking, what is this message all about? What's happening? You know, the Ruach HaKodesh will cause tears to come to your eyes of transformation because he loves you. He loves you. Hosea is the one who makes salvation. That's what his name means. It derives from the same verb as Isaiah for salvation. Yeshua, Yehoshua. It derives from the same verb. So he is coming with a message of salvation. And that's the very message that we are meant to be carrying today to this generation. I want to ask you a question. Do you know how to bring forth the message of salvation today? We have to learn. We have to understand. We have to come in to his presence. We have to take up uh, the, the execution stake and follow after our Savior. He died for you. Will you live for him? Will you pay the price to walk in his ways? Well, I just wanted assurance, actually. That's all I was looking for. I just had my insurance. And now here's my assurance. Well, it's not going to go well for you. The Savior needs you. He needs you. Where are the people that are praying, here I am, send me, use me? Do we truly believe the words that are written in this book that we hold? Hosea brought forth this prophecy eight centuries before the Messiah came. His life is a shadow picture of the Messiah as well. His mercy is going to pour out upon his people. This message that we read in the book of Hosea hasn't even come to pass yet. We are living in the days where we, I believe, will start to witness the regathering of his people and those who are not a people once again become a people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the book of Hosea, though it may be a message of conviction, it's also a message of, of Yehovah's steadfast love for Israel. He loves you with a passion. He will go beyond all measure because he knows our weaknesses. And at Mount Sinai, when they denied the, the, the Ruach HaKodesh, when they said, no, no, don't speak. We don't want to hear directly from you. Just speak to us through Moshe. Everything's going to be okay. We are coming up in this season to Shavuot. What's the power and what's the blessing of Shavuot? That we will have the outpouring of the Ruach HaKodesh. His Spirit will fill us. We need the fire of the Spirit. We need the empowerment of the Spirit to live this life. How many of you try to live this life in the flesh? It doesn't work, does it? You can't do this in the flesh. You can't understand it in the flesh. Here we are, you know, trying to become Greek and Hebrew scholars and trying to work it all out and get into the depth of this and the depths of that. And, you know, we go beyond and all these different, you know, we, we just <laughs> go totally down one path just so that we can break down, you know, the 49th armpit hair of the Antichrist, you know. And we think that by doing that, we're going to achieve Knowledge beyond measure. The reality is you can't understand this word without the Spirit. So we come into the Hebraic walk of our faith. We come to the realization of coming back to Torah. And all of a sudden we think all we have to do is just get education, just learn. Yes, we need to learn. But if you don't have the Ruach HaKodesh, if you don't have the Spirit, you can't live it. In the counting of the Omar, as we count down, what are we preparing for? In this spring feast time, what are we preparing for? It's about who we are personally. We have our salvation. We deal with the sin within our life. We're dealing with the purification as we're walking things through. And we continually need the outpouring of the Spirit. It's not just a one-off event. So Hosea is a message of conviction, but it's also a delivery of Yehovah's steadfast love for his people. The word of Yehovah came to Hosea, son of Biri. During the reign of Uzziah, Jonathan, uh, 
Ahaz and Hezekiah, king of Judah. And during the reign of Jeroboam, son of, of uh, Joash, king of Israel. Before we go any further there, there's something we need to understand. It, the word of Yehovah came to Hosea. I want you to have ears to hear right now. I want you to get hold of this word and understand. Don't move until you receive instructions from above. Don't move until you hear from heaven. Make your commitment, your life walk to be in the place to hear his voice. You don't have to wait until you have a PhD in theology. You don't have to wait until you've gone through Bible school. You just need to know what it is to wait before him to hear from heaven. He will guide you. He will direct you in the way that you should go. The word of Yehovah came to Hosea. His word was so powerful, it didn't just affect his generation. It's affecting the very generation we are living in today. 2,800 years later. Look at this mug. Wow. I've been in some parts of America where you're given a jar. That's pretty cool. I like that. Very European. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that water was good. Excuse me one minute. <laughs> oh, yeah. That should last me another few hours, yeah. <laughs> the word of the Lord came to him. The word that came brought supernatural transformation to future generations. You know, we're not living after the word. We're still living in the book of Acts. It hasn't concluded yet. We're still walking out this walk. You were <laughs> thought of before the foundations of the earth. The Father knew your name. He knew what he had called you to do. He placed you here for such a time as this. And what does the enemy want you to do? He wants you to just get out of here. Oh, just get me out of here. And you've been born for such a time as this. If we will wait, if we will receive a word from heaven, if we will receive a word of promise and understand the reason why you are born, you'll never be the same. And no weapon forged against you will prosper. Verse 2, when Yehovah began to speak through Hosea, Yehovah said to him, Go take to yourself an adulterous wife and children of unfaithfulness. Because the land is guilty of the vilest adultery in departing from Yehovah. So he married Gomer, daughter of Dibliam. And she conceived and bore him a son. He didn't just, she didn't just bore or bear sons from him. He takes this woman on who already has children from our promiscuous life. Then Yehovah said to Hosea, oh, sorry, yeah, he bore him a son. In verse 4, and Yehovah said to Hosea, call him Jezreel. Jezreel. It derives from the word Israel, from the valley of Jezreel. Because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre of Jezreel. And I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. Just think about this for a second. He's going to punish the house of, Ye of Jehu. Wasn't he the one who had the prophet pour the anointing over his life and declare him as king and give him a word, give him a promise? And what did he do with that promise? He took hold of the promise and then he transformed it into his own personal agenda. Oh, I'll do the promise of what you've said, but now I'm going to change it a little and I'm going to bring it into my personal agenda. I want the political benefits of this, not just the anointing of the Spirit, not just to do what you're saying. Now I'm going to use that anointing. I'm going to use that authority that you've given me and I'm going to use it for my own ends. And that's what we see so much today. People are anointed. They are called by Yehovah, and they take that anointing and they use it for their own personal agenda. 
and they deceive many. That's why so many people are leaving churches today and walking out. What's it all about? Why are we in these places? They get through the message, then it comes to the end of the message, and here comes the agenda of the anointed one who's using that position of anointing, that position of authority to bring forth another word, to bring forth something that is going to bring them personal benefits instead of staying with the program. Call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. In that day, I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. Israel, Jezreel, God will sow or God will scatter. He's saying, I'm going to scatter my people because of your disobedience, because you have departed from me, because you have moved off into adulterous lifestyle. Listen, you are going to worship something. I want to ask you to take account of your life right now as we prepare for Shavuot. Take account. What are you worshiping? Oh, I worship Yeshua. Okay. Maybe on Shabbat you do. But come on, take the account and ask yourself the question. Where's the priorities in your life? Is it truly to be in his presence? Do we know what it is to wait on him? Do we know what it is to sit before him? Are we worshiping other gods? We need to be challenged because this is the hour, this is the time. That's why I love the feast. That's why I'm so blessed to be walking back in the Torah to come to this realization and understanding because we have to get into uh, the motion of the Father. We've got to get into His cycles. It's got to push us out of the agendas of how we flow and function within this world. It makes demands upon our lives that we don't normally have if you're just going to church on Sunday. Because now we have to realize that these feasts have a, a reason. They have a meaning. We're meant to apply it to our lives. We're meant to walk this through. We're meant to carry out, uh, you know, different things within the feasts. And also on the Shabbat, you know, just the fact of resting on Shabbat. For some people, that is huge. Okay, I'm not going to touch the washing machine today. <laughs> you know, Whew, that was hard. I'm going to rest. Well, that's, we, don't, we don't know how to stop, do we? We just want to keep going, but we have to learn to rest. Why? Because we trust him. He will carry us through. I've got so much to do, okay? <laughs> You're never going to achieve all the things you have to do without him. We need him. Verse 6, Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then Yahovah said to Hosea, call her Ro-Ruhamah. For I will no longer show love to the house of Israel that I should forgive, that I, sh that I should at all forgive them. Yes, I will show love to the house of Judah and I will save them, not by bow, sword or battle or by horse or horseman, but by Yahovah their Elohim. Well, come on. You know, I can't believe what I'm reading here. If I was just looking at the newspaper for today, and this was just, you know, Hosea's just given us the news. It wouldn't be in the New York Times. It'd probably be one that gives real news, you know. Here's Hosea's little column. I'm picking it up, reading his little column. And it says, yeah, I will show love to the house of Judah. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> you know. This is bothering me. What do you mean you're going to show love to the house of Judah? And I will save them. I don't want to hear this. As Israel, in the days of Hosea, put yourself there and just think about what's going on. Here he is naming his children. Is this the first sign of child abuse? <laughs> he wants to get the message out to his people that he's naming his children. So every time he calls on that child, the, the people around him will hear and understand the word of Yehovah, that they will take heed to this message. We are called to be an example of the word of the message to this generation. So what's your name? Is your name E.R.? 
from Winnie the Pooh. What's your name? Who does he say you are? What's your calling? Who are we called to be? You know, we live in a generation where a name doesn't really mean too much these days. But back here, the name meant everything. Hosea. What are we talking about? He who makes salvation. His name has a meaning. His name had a meaning. Yet I will show love to the house of Judah, and I will save them. Now, here's something that's very important. He doesn't say by anything that you can find within this world. He will not save them just because he anoints them and gives them an ability. He says this, not by bow, sword, or battle, or by horse or horseman, but by Yehovah their Elohim. This is supernatural. Why is he reaching out to Judah at this time? Because we know very well that from Jeremiah chapter 3, <coughs> we know what happened to the house of Judah. They also went off into adultery. They also did all the things that Israel did. But why did the father divorce or, or Yeshua divorce from Israel? Why? And not from Judah. Because of the promise. It wasn't because of who they were. It's because of who he is. We also come to a place where we see Yeshua being rejected by Judah. And we see clearly that Judah does come to the place. After the Messiah comes, it brings us all the way to the place where Yeshua actually has to deal with Judah. And he has to cut Judah off. But for both parts, it's not the end of the story. This is not a message of depression. It's a message of hope. In Acts chapter 3, it says in verse 22, um, it says, For Moshe said, Yehovah, your Elohim will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must shamar. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who doesn't listen to him will be completely cut off from amongst his people. That was another news report that went out from Peter that wasn't well received by the people. What's he saying? If you don't accept Yeshua the Messiah, if you reject him, if you will not listen to him, if you disobey what is written in Deuteronomy chapter uh, 18, because that's where he's pulling this scripture from. If you are disobeying the Torah and you reject the Messiah, you will be cut off. But there's a grafting in coming. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's a grafting in coming. So here we see in verse 7 of the first chapter of the book of Hosea, I will show love to the house of Judah. I will save them not by bow, sword, or battle, or by horse, or horseman, but by Yehovah, their Elohim. After she has weaned Lo Ruhama, Gomer had another son, and Yehovah said, Call him Lo Ami. For you are not my people, and I am not your Elohim. This is the most devastating moment in the history of Israel. You are not my people. Anyone that's ever faced divorce, anyone that's ever faced tough places, when a loved one comes in and throws the suitcases on the bed and is leaving, you are not my people. This is over. This is over. It's a devastating blow. It's a devastating moment. And this is what's happening here as Hosea is speaking forth and living out the word of Yehovah. Thank you, Father. He doesn't stop there and we're not in cut and paste Christianity because if we're in cut and paste Christianity, you'd have to come back next week. But since we're not in cut and paste Christianity, we're going to read the next verse. Yet! Hallelujah. What an amazing word. Let's just read the previous verse and bring in the yet. Then Yehovah said, Call him Lo Ami, for you are not my people, and I am not your Elohim. Yet the Israelites will be like the sand of the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted. In the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, they will be called sons of the living Elohim. 
the people of Judah and the people of Israel will be reunited and they will appoint one leader and will come out, come up out of the land for great will be the day of Jezreel. Jezreel. Great will be the day of Israel. One leader, Yeshua the Messiah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yezreel. Elohim will scatter. Are you facing disappointment? Are you disappointed with your walk with Yehovah? Oh God, it's your fault what I'm going through. You just don't love me. I'm just going through this and going through that. and Everyone else gets a nice life and look at me. Look what I get to go through. I want to break disappointment today in Yeshua's name. Lo Rahana, no mercy, no mercy, despised. Are you despised today? Lo and me, not my people. Are you disowned? I just want to release a prophetic word right now for you to catch. Hear the word of Yahovah. I am calling you unto myself, says Yehovah. You thought you've gone so far that you can't even return. You might think you are so broken that you can't even get up again. And I speak the life of the Spirit into your life right now. I say it's time to rise up. It's time to rise up and be everything that the Father has called you to be. You might feel that you're at the place where you're just, I'm done. I just can't do it anymore. Have you ever been there? Where you've just lifted up your hands and said, I'm done? I was in the lat a few years ago, doing some snorkeling, having some fun. <sighs> Me and snorkeling just don't get on too well. You know, every time I go snorkeling, I end up in hospital pretty much. Anyway, I'm doing some snorkeling, looking at the coral reef and a lat and just enjoying it. i just taken a group uh, to uh, Petra in Jordan. And uh, a wave comes over my pipe. And, you know, I'm not stupid. I'm a grown man. <laughs> what do you do if a wave comes over your pike, pipe and you're snorkeling? You put your tongue or you blow it out. Uh, what did I do? Don't try that. It is not good. And when I did that, what happened? My lungs were filled with seawater. It was so painful. It was like I was being stabbed. And I go down in the water. All of a sudden, I move from having a happy moment, looking at some little fishies going by. And then the next minute, I'm fighting for my very life. And you fight. And uh, I won't give you all the sound effects, just in case any of you are eating dinner right now. You know, and, and you're trying to get it out. Just get the water out of your lungs. You've got to get that air in. You've got to fight. This is the, very most, in, this is the most important moment of your life. You can't live with water in your lungs. And I fight and I fight and I'm heaving it all up and it's all up and it's all coming up. And then I'm on top of the water and I just put my head back and I'm now at the moment where I just believe that this is the moment where I can take a deep breath and I can receive the very air I need for life. I'm convinced that I've got the water out enough so that I can take a breath in and live. I put my head back and it's the most important moment of my life and I go... And as I do that, a wave comes over my face and I'm already committed and I've got to put the deepest breath that I could ever do to get uh, air into my lungs to live. And instead, I fill my lungs with water. And as I go down in the water, I remember, I'm just going down, I, I'm done. It took me all my energy, took me all my strength, took me all my ability to get that water out. The first time. And I was going down. And I'll never forget that moment. It will never leave me. It was so. Impacting to my life. I'll never forget it. This is what I said. I said okay father I'm done. I'm done. 
it's over. There is no physical strength left in my body. I had no ability to function, and I was just sinking in the water. And then something happened. The father didn't have to do this at all. He could have just taken me home right there, right then. And I saw my gravestone right in front of me. I have this open vision. There's my gravestone. It says, Kenny Russell dies in the Red Sea with the Egyptians. Oh, something hit my spirit. I did not come to the land of Israel. I did not come to the land of Israel to die in the Red Sea with the Egyptians. I came to walk in his promises. I came to be a prophetic voice to bring change to this generation. Something started to rise up in me when I saw those words. Kenny Russell dies in the Red Sea with the Egyptians. I was not accepting the words on that tombstone. That is not going to be the, the last message that people hear about Kenny Russell. Ah, oh, remember Kenny Russell? Yeah, he died in the Red Sea with the Egyptians. That is not going to happen. For his name's sake, <laughs> that is not going to happen. He gave me the ability. He gave me strength. And whew, all of a sudden, I had a supernatural ability. And I saw the work of the Ruach HaKodesh. You might think you're done. You might think you have gone beyond anything that you could ever have done to get through whatever circumstance you're facing. You might be in the place where you say it's over. Some of you are watching right now. You're in so much financial ruin, you don't even think you're going to get through the next day. It's time to hand it over to the Father. It's time for our hope to be aligned with His promise. Listen, that's going to take time. It's not just going to happen in five minutes. We've got to align ourselves with His Torah with his word. We've got to not just understand our identity. We have to understand what the Father is doing and how we become a part of his work. So the good news is I was able to rise up by the Spirit. I was able to clear my lungs. I was able to breathe again and get out of the water. But let me tell you something. I know what it's like to be in a place where it's over. And here we see in this first chapter of Hosea, we see the prophet giving forth this message. It is over. We are finished. You are disowned. Yet, there's coming a day. There's coming a day. And I'm going to skip ahead to a couple of verses that I want us to read. And I want us to go to a place of prayer. In chapter 2, verse 14, it says, Therefore, I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her. There I will give her back the vineyards, and I will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. There she will sing in the days of her youth as in the day she came up out of Egypt. Isn't it amazing how often we need to go back and we need to understand the works of the Father. We have to go back to Egypt, but there's a day coming according to Jeremiah chapter 16, that we will no longer talk about the first exodus. You know, if you're in a place where you can't get through and you have no hope, you don't have to just look at what's happening in your life. Go to the Word and start looking at what the Father did in other people's lives, in the nation's lives. In that day, declares Yehovah, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. I will remove the names of of the bales from her lips, no longer will the names be invoked. Even though you might think it's all gone, that you can't see, I'm just in a place of isolation. Where are the people that I can fellowship with? Where is the worship? Where is, is the fellowship as we are walking in this Torah? Where is the promises concerning the word within our lives? I will make the valley of Akor, a door of hope. I will make the valley of trouble. 
That's what Akor means. It means trouble. I will make the valley of trouble a door of hope. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He will make uh, that valley a door of hope. What trouble are you facing? This is the day. This is the hour for that very trouble. The very thing that the enemy is using to defeat you, to break you. Maybe even the Father is breaking you because of your lifestyle. Oh, we want to give the devil a hard time through all the things we're going through. I want to just pause a second because these are holy moments. I want to ask you a question. Are you going through the things you're going through because of disobedience? Just ask him right now. Just say, Father, speak to me by your spirit. Hosea is God's steadfast love. But it's also a message of conviction. This is a day for prophetic alignment. This is the day where the Father is saying, I'm going to put you back on track. And you don't have to be afraid. You might feel like you don't have enough hope, just like when I was drowning. I gave up. I had no hope. But then here comes a message. I pray that this message is a message of hope. This might save your life. I break the spirit of suicide right now in Yeshua's name. You don't have to come to the place of despair beyond anything to the place where you feel like the Father has disowned you. No, He loves you. He cares for you. He is reaching out right now to bring forth your deliverance, to bring forth your healing right now. We need the deep work of the Spirit to take place within our lives because that's what gives us the authority to rise up by the Spirit. We don't just need a word. Because we're just reading something. We don't just need to be people who repeat what someone else said. We need to be people that know what it is to dwell within his presence. The whole reason for the restoration, the whole reason for the Messiah coming is so that he may dwell with us, that we may come in and eat with him and he with us. Hallelujah. It's relationship. It's walking with him. Is that the element that's missing in your life? Have you just bought into religion? Then today be free in Yeshua's name. Walk in freedom in Yeshua's name. He is the Redeemer. Yeshua is the Redeemer. We call Israel to return to their Elohim. If you're still sitting in the Christian church and not even growing and not even following the Sabbath and walking in the Torah, then I challenge you today. I'm not saying just get up and leave churches. Listen, if they have Messiah, you know, we're not... We're not trying to set a new cult. That's not what we're trying to do. But what we're, we're doing is let's get the word right. Let's talk to the leaders of fellowships and saying, are we truly following the Bible, following the scriptures? Are we a Bible-believing community? Let's challenge these things. Why? Because we need to see entire fellowships turn round and humble themselves before the Father and come back to the Torah. If you're a leader watching right now and you're convicted with the need to come back to the Torah and walk in the Shabbats and walk in the feasts and walk in His ways and obey His commandments, then it's time to wake up. Teach your congregation just like Arthur did for a whole year about the Sabbath and walking in the feast. Teach the people so they can walk in truth. I want us to stand right now. We're going to pray. And if you're watching at home or you're watching on YouTube or through any other means right now, I want to ask you to stand right now too, no matter where you are, unless you're driving, of course. Then just stay sitting right there. Keep your seatbelt on. Everything's going to be okay. If you're in an airplane, just stay seated. Everything's fine. But you know what? Let's, you know, one thing that really challenges me, I travel. I have the place where I like to sit when I'm at home to get in the Word. Do you all have that place where you like to go and you like to study the Word, you like to hear from Him? You know, I've got my chair, you know, where I just go and listen. When you travel, 
you know, the first thing I want to look for when I get somewhere is, where's my place? That I can just wait before Him. We can get so busy, but we need to hear from heaven. We need to hear His Word. His Word is alive. As we read the pages of, of the Scriptures, are we absorbing the very words, the very nature of our Elohim? He is an awesome God. We need him more. If you're in that place right now where you just want to cry out to him, just do it right now. Just lift your hands before him and say, Father, I need you more. I don't have the ability to get through life. I don't have the ability to walk past this day. My life is full of disappointment because I've been following other gods. I'm despised. I have no mercy because I'm not walking in your ways. I'm in sin. Forgive me, Father, today. Maybe the Father even had to cut you off because of your lifestyle. Maybe you had to be excommunicated from His presence because of the other gods that you brought before Him. And we call you back today. Humble yourselves before Him. This is a book of hope. Father, you are an Elohim of hope. Yeshua, you paid the price for us. When all these blessings and all these curses I have set before you come upon you, and you take them to heart wherever Yehovah, your Elohim, disperses you among the nations. And when you and your children return to Yehovah, your Elohim, and obey Him with all of your heart and with all of your soul, according to everything I command you today, then Yehovah, your Elohim, will restore your fortunes. He'll have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where He has scoured you. Even if you've been banished to the outermost parts of the earth, this is a call to come home. We know the story of the prodigal son in the Gospels, but here we have in the book of Hosea, the prodigal wife. Come back. Come back. I call you back in Yeshua's name. <laughs> Don't come back with the ability of the flesh. You just surrender everything and come back by the Spirit. May we be raised up by the Ruach HaKodesh. May we be raised up by the Spirit. We prophesy an open heaven over our lives right now in Yeshua's name. Be healed in Yeshua's name. Be restored in Yeshua's name. Not by might, nor by power, but by Spirit. It's by Spirit. Oh, Holy Spirit, do your work right now. Do your work. I speak an open heaven over your life. Do your work, Holy Ghost. May you be filled. May you be empowered. May you be ready. You've just got just a few weeks to go where we can all come together as a holy convocation to celebrate Shavuot. May your testimony of that day be an outpouring because of today. Receive the outpouring of the Spirit. Don't leave His presence. Just stay right there. David, just worship, just worship, because people need the release. They need to be free. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Just take this time of worship. Just come before Him. Just watch what He's going to do.
don't want me, Lord. Cause that's the price to pay that I just can't afford. Wanna be more. There is a, a special freeing anointing here tonight. I'm, I'm standing there and I'm trying to hear what, what Father is saying. And he shows me individuals who are crying out for freedom making declarations of release me, release me, release me. And it's, it's difficult for me to, to pinpoint if you're speaking to the enemy who has strongholds, for I know that Father has already released you. And what I'm, what I'm gathering <clears throat> from that is you don't ask the devil or any stronghold that has been placed on you to leave you alone or to release you from that. But you're going to have to take your freedom. You're going to have to walk away from that, not ask it to let you go but to take the freedom that Messiah has already made available for you. You don't need Satan's permission. Don't need the devil's permission. You don't need anyone's permission to accept the release, the freedom that you've been given. All you need to do is just grab a hold of it. And you say, well, what does that look like? How do I do that? And the answer that, that I have is in order for you to walk away, you're going to have to grab a hold of something lest you turn and, and go back. 
And so this, this is an invitation for you to literally put your hand in the hand of the husband, the one who has paid for your freedom, the one who have given you the freedom that he is giving you here tonight. And as Brother Kenny has, has spoken to the spirit of destruction, even the suicidal spirit, that which tries to hold people in bondage and when it sees someone trying to take their freedom, literally decide to try to take their life. But tonight is the night where freedom prevails. And you, you have to walk out of the place that you're in. And this is really supernatural, but it will manifest itself in the natural. The first thing you do is you make the determination that I am going to walk this freedom out. I'm leaving this life that I'm in. I will no longer be bound, nor will I give place or permission for whatever it is that has a hold on you to have a hold on you anymore. You declare your freedom and you make the declaration, I am free. I declare my freedom in Messiah Yeshua. I declare my freedom tonight. I declare my freedom in every aspect of my life and I will walk in the freedom that I have received for whom the Son set free is free indeed. I am free indeed. I declare my freedom in Yeshua's name. Make that declaration. Make that declaration tonight. And I firmly believe that Father has empowered you. He's empowered us to walk out this freedom. There's, there's, there's plenty of material that we, we made available and, and, and we're not selling it. It doesn't cost you anything to have access to it. Pulling down strongholds, the power of your words, so many things that are there that all you have to do is take advantage of. We're, we're very blessed tonight to have Brother Kenny, Dr. Kenny with us tonight. Is there anything else you would you feel necessary to, to say? Brothers and sisters, it's really on you. You, you, can, you can have your seats for a moment. It's really left up to you. There are several things I, I know when Brother Kenny was talking about the fighting for his life and just knowing the terrifying moments and what his family was going through and how it took some time for that recuperation to take place. And yet to be here to testify and to tell the story of the deliverance, the freedom that has been wrought in Messiah and the call to go to the nations of the world and to declare not only what he has done in your life, but what he is capable and will do in the lives of all who put their faith in, the, in him. The beauty of our Messiah is he's made it very clear that those who put their faith in him will never, ever be put to shame. And this is not something that you can do today and, you know, vacillate between the old and the new life, but it's something that you have to make a commitment. And that's the first thing, is really making a commitment that you're going to walk this life and this walk out. I know that once you make that commitment, and it's not making the commitment to your, your spouse or, 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 or to your family, or, but to him and to yourself. 
that you're going to commit to walk this life out. And once you make that commitment, I believe that Father begins to show you how to do it. Until you make that commitment, it's, it's, it's elusive. It's like, well, what do I do? Well, what do I do? Well, you make the commitment, and he will show you. It's like as you take a step in him, he show you the next step. And this is where he literally begins to order your steps. And so I just want to encourage you, take your freedom, walk in your freedom. We're going to bring this service uh, to a close tonight. I know typically what we would do is we would have a Q&A and give people opportunities to give. And we do. We invite you to support the ministry with your tithing offerings. But at this point, I just want us to, I just want us to end um, tonight. And if you want to support the ministry, you can. You're certainly welcome to do that. But I want you to be left with what has been done here tonight. And this is not for folks that are just, um, so it's not just for folks who may have not started this journey. If you've been on this journey for a while and you recognize some things in your life that is holding you back and keeping you from walking in the fullness of what Father has called you to do, this is for you. This is for all of us. As I was standing there, I was looking at areas in my life where I need to take that next step. And being convicted in areas to where, you know, you have to very, very well be careful that you don't take the anointing, the calling on your life and then try to turn it into something personal. It always has to be about what he has called you to do. And that has to be foremost, the most important thing, lest you mix your life and the calling together. And that's literally what can pervert what he has called you to do. So we have to stay focused. Amen. Well, at this